That was very warm. Thank you. Um, no, I'm not going. I don't have PowerPoint. It's, I've, I've been billed to speak for an hour. I felt an hour of pictures of schematics of drones and dead Pakistani children would just be a bit too much. That said, um, uh, I will probably be referring to my notes quite a lot. So please have some patience. I crave an indulgence. Um, yeah, so I've, I've been at the, the Bureau of Investigative Journalism for nearly three years. For pretty much all of that time, um, I've been working on our covert drone war project. It's a data-driven project. We um, uh, collect data on US drone strikes in Pakistan, Yemen, and Somalia. Um, and we use that data to uh, sort of base our investigations. It, it provides the backbone for a lot of our work. You know, sort of, uh, the Bureau um, likes to use sort of empirical evidence where we can get it in order to support our investigations rather than just anecdotes uh, from whatever sources that we're speaking to. Um, before I worked at the Bureau, I worked in Geneva and I worked in Iraq, and then before that I was a student. So, I mean, I've, and that was six months, three months in each country. So I really only just started being a journalist. Um, and I've spent my entire career at what is basically an anomaly in the UK, which is a philanthropically funded organization that does investigative journalism. It's really common in the US, much more common in the US. There's something like 90 similar institutions, um, the most famous being like ProPublica, uh, which breaks amazing stories about US healthcare and um, the uh, incredibly damaging conditions of a um, juvenile detention center in New York. Um, so it's common there, and they're filling a gap that's been left by the slowly twitching corpse of the print industry. Um, we're always a little bit behind in the UK when it comes to things in the US. We're always sort of playing, slightly playing catch up. So our print industry is still going, and they're still doing investigations to some extent. I mean, Snowden Files is quite a good one, um, but less and less. And we were set up with an eye on what the Sunday Times Insight team used to do back in the 70s, breaking extraordinary stories, changing the law, um, exposing scandals, doing journalism that benefits, that is of public benefit, not just of public interest, but public benefit. Um, uh, and in amongst that, we've done various sort of things recently. We've been working on um, government finance, on the banking sector, one of my colleagues has changed the way that the government and the police record rape statistics because before her investigation they were doing it uh, well, very wrong. Um, and then amongst all of that we work on drones and our drones project is slightly different to everything else we do. <coughs> Maybe based on data like a lot of the rest of our stories. Um, but we've married two disciplines in order to do it. We've married investigative journalism and Casualty recording. Um, casualty recording is a, is a discipline in and of itself. I don't know if any of you have ever come across the organization called Iraq Body Count, but this is like one of the best exponents of casualty recording. At the start of the Iraq war in 2003, a US Army general says, we don't do body counts. We are, we're not interested in how many Iraqis are going to be killed by our incursion. And some people in um, London decided that somebody should um, and started to count the number of civilians who were dying as a consequence of the coalition invasion. And it's staggering, and they keep doing it. And to plug our work, if you want to check out our podcast, we interviewed their senior researcher not too long ago. It's a really affecting interview as to what casualty recording is and how it can be of benefit and how it can affect the people involved in it. So it's a, it's a fairly sort of... Considerable, de considerable departure from our you know, day-to-day -day work as journalists. Um, I mean, the Bureau is something of an ivory tower, I must say. We don't have to churn out six stories before lunch. Uh, we get to spend six months on a story. Uh, and this is why we've been able to do the drones project since 2011. Um, before I sort of go even further into our work on drones and how we record casualties and what our investigations have turned up and the, the wider drone war, the US drone war. I should probably talk to you a bit about drones as a concept and as things. Um, I, don't, so I, I understand that some of you guys are fairly well clued up on this, some maybe less so, so if this is 
things that you know, then my apologies. If it's stuff that you don't, then hopefully you'll find it interesting, um, possibly entertaining. I don't know. Um, but first, uh, a, a, a bugbear of mine and a specific word, which is drone, which really annoys people. It's extraordinary how angry it makes the people who make drones and the people who use drones. Given that the users of the drones are people like the CIA and US Special Forces and, and, and other um, militaries like the, the RAF, uh, you'd imagine that their irritation at the word drone, because it has negative connotations, might be something to do with how they're using their drones themselves. But um, be that as it may, they, <laughs> they see that it has negative connotations, that it's um, somehow implying that these things are brainless, uh, out of control, flying death robots. Um, and I should say now that as things stand, the vast majority of drones, civilian, military, armed, unarmed, are controlled by people. They are either a few hundred feet away or a few thousand miles away, but they're usually, for the predominant length of the flight, in control with a joystick or a tablet in term, for, for some of them. Um, they aren't mindless in that regard. They are remotely controlled. They are not uncontrolled. Uh, I mean, yeah, you're talking about ne negative connotations. The, the Terminator concept is something that really annoys people. And I was at an industry, um, industry conference a few months ago where this Canadian guy from a Canadian drone manufacturer got up uh, and he began his spiel with um, a quite sort of like trenchant attack on the media's representation of drones. And he says, you know, this is dreadful representation of them as these killing robots, these mindless things, and then went on to play his um, sort of corporate marketing video, which had the soundtrack from The Terminator. <laughs> <laughs> Just somewhat <laughs> shooting himself in the foot. Um, but uh, they, 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 they get annoyed about this, and to some extent, I can understand why. Because I, when I say drones, I'd be interested to know how many of you think about the killer drones that are bombing Afghanistan and Pakistan, or whether you think about something else, some other sort of concept. I mean, it's, as far as I'm concerned, media reports of drone strikes around the world and the representation of drones in popular culture has really fixed that weaponized system in the public consciousness. I mean, these things feature in the latest series of Homeland, 24, the latest Bourne film, other uh, films altogether, uh, video games. Uh, it's really sort of become a sort of entrenched concept. And so if you're making something which is basically like a flying video camera for an independent filmmaker to use, you can be slightly frustrated. Um, but <laughs> the alternatives um, aren't great. Uh, the current one that the British military really likes is RPA, Remotely Piloted Aircraft, or RPAS, Remotely Piloted Air Systems, RPAS for short, which is slightly grim. There are others. There's UAVs, Unmanned Aerial Vehicles, UAS, Unmanned Aerial Systems, UCAVs or UCAVs, Unmanned Combat Air Vehicles, Remotely Piloted Systems or RPS, and even RPAV, Remotely Piloted Air Vehicles, which I, if you're writing copy is ridiculous. I mean, you're never going to spell all of that out and then put it in brackets and then continue writing on. Um, Truth is, we all call them drones, not because we think that they are necessarily these death-dealing robots from the sky. I mean, you, they're, they're, I've seen polls where people are given the word drone and they ask if, if it's a positive or a negative word, and it's sort of, you know, 50-50, really. Some people think it's a good thing, some people think it's a bad thing. The word itself doesn't ca necessarily carry that uh, 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 negative connotations to repeat a phrase. Um, uh, 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 we use drones essentially because it's the word that we use. It's like using Hoover instead of vacuum cleaner. And also President Obama uses drones. So frankly, if the leader of the free world is doing it, we are fine. Um, I don't really object to people using bewildering acronyms. When I was in Geneva, I worked for the World Health Organization, which is basically an acronym factory. And I, I, I enjoyed it. I'm proud to say that I worked there and I helped them develop ever more bewildering acronyms. I do object to people telling me what words I'm supposed to use and words I'm not supposed to use. 
no one seems to be objecting quite so much as uh, uh, Her Majesty's government, or at least they, these are the people I interact with um, who push back on it the strongest. I've had press officers at the MOD who will refuse to deal with my questions because I've called their drone a drone and I haven't called it a Reaper or an RPAS or something like that. And frankly, when you're getting into prescribed language when you're dealing with a government, it is sort of Orwellian, or is that an overreach? I, I don't know. I, I think it is, but then again, I do this all the time, and I deal with these people all the time, and they can be quite truculent, so perhaps I'm overreacting, I'm not sure. Um, anyway, sorry, rant over. Um, drones are now everywhere. These are, you know, a ubiquitous thing. They see popping up all over the place. Amazon is making one that's going to deliver packages. Google's making one that takes dog food to people in the outback in Australia. Um, there's the burrito bomber, and if you haven't seen this, this is fantastic. It will, de it will deliver a GPS-guided lunch to wherever you are with a parachute, you'll be pleased to hear. Um, they're also being used for serious purposes, I hasten to add. Um, filmmakers can use them to, make, to, 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 to produce really extraordinary footage for, you know, for, for, for pictures that a massive rig and great time of expense or a helicopter would have been required in the past. And I urge you, if you haven't already, to seek out footage of this guy cycling across this ridge in the far northern reaches of Scotland. And all he's got is a little drone with a GoPro and a GoPro on his helmet. And the footage is really extraordinary. Um, I know a chap, this architect, who's been commissioned to make a one-to-one -one model of a Spitfire. Um, He's been forced, because there aren't actually schematics of Spitfires anymore, to go find this Spitfire down at RAF Duxford and scan it so he can get the dimensions for his statue, for his model. Um, and he's going to use a drone. He's going to get set up scanners all around the circumference of it. And then he's going to use a drone to fly over the top to scan the dorsal section, which a sort of airfixy Jack Hawkins enthusiast kind of way is kind of cool. I don't know. I quite like that. Um, academics use them. There's uh, academics at uh, Cranfield University who um, use them to help them discern different ecosystems, the health of different ecosystems in stretches of river. So the drone hovers overhead and takes photographs and um, they can use that to enable their, to improve their analysis. And it means PhD students don't have to stand nipple deep in cold river water holding you know, those measuring sticks and that sort of thing. Uh, and farmers, precision farming is becoming an increasingly important thing. Um, drones have been shown to be really useful in demonstrating where crops are growing weakest and where weeds are growing strongest and where you need to target your fertilizer and your pesticides. And in the, I mean, precision farming has been around for years, um, but it's been with satellites and that's just not a practical way of using the technique. It's uh, extremely expensive for starters. Um, drones are being used more now than they were in the recent past in the sort of civilian sphere. I think in the last decade, people came across this like unmanned system concept and thought, wow, I'm going to get hold of that. And it was before the bust, so they all had quite large budgets, so these government departments and police forces um, invested in these new toys and didn't really know um, how to use them. And I think now, I mean, post, post the bust, budgets are tighter, people are being a li little bit more clever about how they spend their money. But also people have realized that drones aren't a panacea, and this applies across the board, civilian and military. Drones are not the be-all and end-all, which is what we've been told for quite a long time. Um, drones fit a specific purpose, and if your needs conform with that, 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 those attributes, then great, it's a useful tool, otherwise don't bother. Good example of this is, um, quite amusingly, a police service and a fire service. The police service in Liverpool, Merseyside Police, bought a drone, I think in 2009 or something like that, or maybe earlier, um, and they tried to, you know, they flew it and they tried to use it to improve their police work, and they, I think like dozens of times, I can't remember the exact figure, they launched this drone and they tried to use it to catch a criminal. And eventually they did. They, caught, they, they used it to, catch, to, to follow a guy and to find him hiding behind some bins. I think he'd been trying to rob uh, stereos out of a car park. And they trumpeted their great success. And unfortunately, they trumpeted it a bit too loudly because the Civil Aviation Authority turned up and said, you haven't got a license to use this drone. <laughs> um, which meant that they had to ground the drone. They didn't ground it for very long because it emerged about a year later. This, this, Grounding happened in February 2010. It emerged about a year later that that same month they'd started flying it again 
and on a training exercise who crashed into the River Mersey. So Merseyside police don't have a drone anymore. Um, Gatwick, police in Gatwick do, which is interesting in and of itself, but the West Midlands Fire Service, I, I particularly like the West Midlands, so that's why I'm bringing them up. Um, they use a drone, they use it very well. They use it to enable their fire crews to avoid hot spots in burning buildings. They use it to take pictures of burnt out buildings for um, training purposes, so they can show their firemen, you know, this is where this particular kind of building burnt the strongest, this is where it burnt the weakest, that sort of thing. Um, and are quite a valuable addition to this fire service's um, repertoire of equipment, I suppose. Um, and so far they haven't crashed it into a river, which is promising. I, I, I don't want to sound too much of a sort of like drone fanatic, although they can be quite cool, um, because obviously in the civilian sphere there are some really, really serious concerns that we should all be aware of. We should all be cognizant of as drones become more prevalent. So there are the obvious privacy issues. I mean, drones will uh, make anybody who is so minded uh, more able to spy on you should they want to, to hover outside your bedroom window, to spy on you whilst you're uh, in your back garden. It's the sunbathing scenario that seems to worry everybody as you're sunbathing in your back garden. <laughs> drone photographs you. No, I, no one would want to photograph me whilst I'm sunbathing, and we live in England. Sunbathing opportunities are minimal. This is more of an American concern. But nevertheless, invasion of your privacy is something you should be aware of, and also something that people who operate drones should be aware of. Because capturing small details like your car number plate or your face or where you live, when they're just pootling about with their drone, with a little GoPro camera on it, that is your information. And to some extent, that is protected information. And as soon as they capture it and record it, there are statutory obligations for them to protect it, and not necessarily even to destroy it, but to make sure it's securely stored. So as we all start to interact with unmanned systems at a more frequent basis, we should be aware of that. There are also undoubtedly civil liberty concerns. I mean, you think about these things as a, I mean, Merseyside police aside, you think about these things as a flying CCTV camera. I think the, well, the, the, the example I can think of that, um, that, that springs to mind is most concerning, and there will be others, but is, if you remember the forward intelligence teams that were run by the Metropolitan Police, and probably still are, I don't know, but back in sort of like 2010, there was a lot of fuss because they were very aggressively surveilling protesters or kids on the streets in estate, in housing estates and that sort of thing. And these are two cops working in partnership who would be filming, photographing people doing legal activities in a sort of quite an ostentatious fashion. So you combine that, I, I'm personally, in my personal opinion, I thought it bordered on harassment. I thought it was really ugly. And in certain cases, I'm sure it did. You combine that with some sort of menacing unmanned system, perhaps with some sort of loudspeaker saying, hey, you there, move along. It's not a, <laughs> it's an ugly concept. And I think it's something that we should be concerned about, especially considering how prevalent CCTV is, and well, I think I'm not going out on too much of a limb to say how useless CCTV is. I think the data shows that it is not as, it's not a panacea. It's not like drones, like, like drones, it's not a panacea. Um, now, civilian drones are a nascent industry to some extent. Um, we've been making them for a while, but it's starting to burge, and military drones have been around for ages. The RAF started developing a drone uh, in 1935, I think, 1935, so before World War II. Um, and they created this system uh, to be used as a, a target for our, our anti-aircraft gunners. Um, it was called the Queen Bee, um, and it's thought that that's where the word drone comes from. It's from Queen Bee to bee to, to drone, also combine it with the sound of a propeller engine. That could well be why we've landed on this, this term instead of our, our pass. I'm not sure. Um, so they, they continue to be used as um, artillery targets. And uh, uh, to they, were, they were flown um, through airspace for fighter jets to try to shoot down all through the Cold War. This was their purpose. But as the Cold War wore on, and they began to become more sophisticated, and they began to become they began to become, they became um, uh, uh, used as sort of uh, uh, surveillance planes for artillery spotting, 
uh, for, for monitoring a particular area, that sort of thing, getting into the realms of which they're used at the moment. Um, now, then, sorry, very few people took up this unmanned system. Israel was hot on it right from the start, back in the 80s. Iran as well, in the um, Iran-Iraq -Iraq war, started to experiment with unmanned systems. The US too. Um, the Brits continued to, 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 to work with unmanned technology right from the, you know, the start, back in the, back in the 30s, but we were never very good at it. Um, and the, 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 the Europeans in general, I think we've been, we've been quite slow in sort of embracing this, that sort of unmanned sphere quite as much as some of our uh, fellow nations. Now, militaries across the globe, uh, from tiny minnows of a country right up, right up to the superpowers and the hyperpowers, have drones. I've stopped bothering to keep track of how many countries have unmanned aircraft, have drones because it just keeps on climbing and climbing. Last figure I saw was a couple of years ago, it was 92. It'll be more. Um, I think as a rule of thumb, if it's a vaguely modern military, um, it's probably got drones. The exception of Canada, interestingly, who have dropped theirs, but I think they'll probably buy some more soon enough. Um, and these are drones that come in all shapes and sizes. They're from the tiny little nanobots to the um, Global Hawk, which has got the wingspan of a Boeing 737 airline. I mean, this thing is huge. It can fly for hours and hours on end, more than 24 hours at extremely high altitude. Um, but um, our work and the kind of the more pointy end of the drone, military drone world, is the, the armed drones. Um, and as far as I know, there are three countries that have used arms drones to kill people. There are more countries that possess them. China and Russia definitely do. Um, South Africa, apparently. Uh, but it's the US, the UK, and Israel are the only ones who've actually used them in a kinetic fashion. The UK have used them in Afghanistan, Israel have used them in Gaza, and the US have used them in Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia, Iraq again, Syria, possibly the Philippines. Um, and they are really kind of like, they really embrace the idea of unmanned systems. They've really kind of gone gung ho on having armed drones. Um, Israel uses them, uh, but unfortunately, we don't really do much work on the Israeli use of drones. And it is interesting the way that they do use them in conjunction with other aircraft when they're incurring into Gaza. But I mean, one of the things that the Bureau does is to focus on things that aren't as well covered as other stories. And when Israel's bombing Gaza, it's global headline news. We, we feel like we can't compete with everyone else when they're covering a story. So we focus on something else. Um, one of the reasons why we focus almost exclusively on the US is um, because of the way that they've been using them. And I'll get on to that in a second. Um, we, the, uh, the, the, the Brits, I should say, sorry. The UK has got um, 10 armed drones. We had five until very recently. And then we got five more uh, just before we left Afghanistan. Um, Bit of a waste of money. No, I mean, look, then Iraq happened, so now they've got a, a new job. Um, and because they were an emergency purchase by the, uh, the MOD during the Afghan war, we realized oh, we need these things. Um, they can't fly in the UK. They can't enter UK airspace. So as we were getting closer and closer and closer to the withdrawal from Afghanistan, we were all trying to work out where on earth they were going to use these drones. What were they going to do with them? You know? They've got this massive... Basically, half of northern Canada belongs to the Ministry of Defence. Slight exaggeration. Um, where they could have flown them. There's a um, proving ground down in Kenya where they could have flown them, or they could have used them in slightly more uh, 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 kinetic fashion. Africa at the moment is, 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 is bubbling away as a, a hot spot of uh, uh, terrorist activity. Yemen and Somalia continue to be very problematic. Were we going to suddenly get involved with what the US is doing, which is targeted killings outside of armed uh, areas of ho uh, hot battlefields like Afghanistan and Iraq and Libya and so forth? As it happens, we haven't yet, but there we go. Um, I did say that we were not so good at um, developing drones. We did have a drone of our own before we bought the American Reaper system, which was called Phoenix. It was a quick sidetrack before we get on with everything else. Um, memory serves the people who used it, which is the 
Royal Artillery coined the phrase to describe it, or they named it as the bugger off, because it never came back. It was not very good. Um, it, it, it was slow, and it was designed to sort of fly over a particular spot and feed back images so that gunners, artillery gunners, could shoot at the right thing. But it wasn't designed to land. It was designed to crash. So it would come to the point where it would, could be recovered, and the operator on the ground would order it to, would control it so that it turned on its back and crashed. And a parachute would come out, and it would slowly float to the ground. I, yeah. The Open University uses the Phoenix program as an example, a case study of how not to organize an engineering project. Um, so we've used our drones in Afghanistan. We've also actually used American drones in Libya. We had this embedding program with the Americans, where we would send some of our RAF pilots off to um, Creech Air Force, Air Force Base in Nevada. And our, 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 our chaps would, um, would be part of an American squadron and fly American drones from an American Air Force Base, and they flew them over Libya. Um, and courtesy of, I think, Tom Watson, we now know this, after he managed to winkle it out of the MOD in a parliamentary question. Um, which begs the question, what were they doing whilst they were under American command? Because it, it, my understanding is that the American mentality towards combat and civilian casualties and so forth is slightly less sympathetic than... Um, the British, but we are assured that they are under, working under British rules of engagement. But it's an interesting example of how these particular systems, it doesn't really matter where you are and almost who you are. You can jump in and out of the hot seat and control it, and it doesn't matter where it is. You're always in control of it from your secluded base in the middle of the desert somewhere. Anyway. We're talking about armed drones. I'm getting sidetracked by the RAF. Armed drones, there are two basic types that the US use and the UK use. One of them, which is Reaper. The other one is Predator. Um, and these things are slow. And they can fly at a sort of medium altitude. And they can fly for about 24 hours over one spot, just orbiting like that. Um, and they can carry missiles. They carry Hellfire missiles. Um, although Britain might be using brimstone missiles in the future, and you think about those guys in the drone industry who whinge about people. Yeah. Negative connotations of the name drones. You've called your systems Predator and Reaper, and they fire hellfire and brimstone. I mean, it's not great. But I, I, it's the military. They love these, these, these things. It's weaponeers. They come up with these extraordinary names. Um, so Predators and Reapers are controlled by satellites. They're controlled by satellites by people, as I say, thousands of miles away from the battlefield. Um, and this satellite link, interestingly, um, causes a delay for the pilots whilst they're operating them. So it's a two or three second delay, like when they're doing a live broadcast on the news with somebody in Ramallah or wherever, and they're using a satellite link. And there's always that slight pause before they answer the guy back in London's question. Similar sort of thing. This makes it extremely difficult to land them as the ground comes up quite fast. So they switch control, and they have guys in Creech, or not in, sorry, not in Creech, in Kandahar, in Afghanistan, who take over the landing and the taking off. Um, though that doesn't um, mean that they don't crash whilst trying to land or take off. In fact, the US has got a drone base in Djibouti in the Horn of Africa, or it had um, in Djibouti. They now had to move it outside of Djibouti, the city. Um, because the government was complaining that these things were crashing so often on like, takeoff and landing. And the US air base is right in the middle of the city, so they were crashing on people's houses. And it didn't, um, didn't go down well, suffice it to say. Um, these things have to fly from bases right in the heart of the action, so Kandahar Air Force, air Force Base, um, uh, other places around Afghanistan, Iraq. They're, 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 they're dotted around the northern borders of, of Iraq and Iraqi Kurdistan and in Turkey. And they have to be that close because they're slow and because they expend too much fuel getting to where they're supposed to be. So they have to spend hours and hours and hours pootling along at 120 miles an hour, 250 miles an hour. Um, and this cuts down the amount of time that they can spend on the station. And the whole purpose of these systems, the whole purpose is for them to be able to orbit over a spot, an eye in the sky, watching a specific house looking out for specific behavior by people in the area, like digging a hole in the road to plant an IED or something like that. And they are there to gather intelligence constantly for hours on end, for 24 hours. And so if you keep
keep them hundreds of miles away, they're going to got like an hour's worth of time flying around. It's fairly useless. Um, they are primarily for gathering intelligence. This is what the Ministry of Defense always tells us, and it is probably true. Um, but they also have this strike function. So as I say, they can loiter over one house or one spot and watch out for a target of opportunity that arises. Maybe they're watching this house and they know that a particular guy lives there, um, and they've got, to get, they've got to kill him. So they watch his patterns of behavior for days on end until they know exactly when his family are going to be coming and going when his kids are going to be playing outside, when they're going to be inside, when they're going to be at school, where he's going to be at different times of day, what parts of the house he's going to be in, whether there's going to be anybody else there, until eventually they build up this pattern of life for this particular individual. But they are confident, to varying degrees, uh, that they're not going to kill anybody else. Collateral damage, that ghastly euphemism that we all seem to deal with now. Um, their sole purpose is to loiter and loiter and loiter and watch and watch and watch and wait and wait and wait and gather more intelligence and more information um, until they can strike. And this is basically what the predator was first developed to do. It was supposed to kill one person. It was supposed to kill Osama bin Laden. Back in the 90s, the CIA had tracked him down to this farmhouse in Afghanistan. Well, farmhouse, big compound, but they called it a farm in Afghanistan. Um, but they couldn't be sure it was him. And they tried cruise missile strikes, just sort of around the same time as the Molokulinsky uh, story was breaking and unfolding. I don't know if any of you remember that the US bombed Afghanistan. That was their attempt to kill bin Laden, and it failed. Um, they had this team of Afghan mercenaries, tribal mercenaries, who were gathering intelligence for them. They were armed to the teeth, but they weren't considered reliable enough to be able to get in there, kill bin Laden, and not just kill everybody else. Um, and they've discovered there was this Israeli guy in California making this system, an unmanned system that could fly for ages and could watch and wait. And he was struggling to sell it. Um, the US Air Force was taking too long to decide whether or not they wanted to buy it, and this guy was going bankrupt. CIA swooped in, bought the project, and weaponized it, and ultimately failed to kill bin Laden, obviously. But that was the sole principle of that, and, that, and that's how it has developed since then, and it's been its sort of overriding feature. It is essentially a counterinsurgency weapon or a counterterrorism weapon. It's not something that you'd use in some great tank battle across the plains of Crimea. Um, it's something you use in an area where you have total control of the airspace. I mean, the, the original predators were so slow, if they flew into a headwind, they'd start going backwards. If the wings iced too much, too much they'd fall out of the sky. We, they've moved on since then, but this is the limitations of the technology. It's not stealthy. It's very slow. It will get shot down quite easily. This is why they've not been used very extensively in Libya. Sorry, not Libya, Syria. Um, this is why they were used extensively in Libya, but after Gaddafi's air defense system had been taken out. Um, and this is why they've been used in Iraq. It's a permissive environment. Yemen, the government welcomes the drones. Somalia, there is no government. Pakistan interesting case. Some of the government welcomes the drones, some of it claims not to. Um, and Afghanistan, obviously, Afghanistan, we're in complete control of the Afghan airspace. The Reaper is marginally more powerful than the Predator, I should say. It's, it's bigger, it can carry more weapons and more bombs, but it's basically the same thing. And it, we, I can keep being boring about these um, airframes, where they're essentially just big remote control airplanes, um, and banging on about how they're used and that sort of thing, and not to tell you the most important point, which is that they are an output or a very pointy end of a very long chain, a very long system, or an output of a big machine. It's massive intelligence, ga information gathering, analyzing, process, processing, and intelligence producing machine. Ultimately, the intelligence that is produced by this global network of individuals, government, civilian contractors like um, Mr. Snowden, they produce intelligence which drives the strikes that the drones carry out. Interesting, the drones are both end of the system. They pick up, in, they pick up information, 
which is then processed and analyzed and used to, for them to then prosecute their strikes. So don't think of them as just an aircraft that's controlled by satellites, a glorified remote control plane. Try to think of the whole system. And it's important to emphasize that because you can sort of, I mean, to mix so many metaphors, this is a very big hammer that has been created, this global system. It's a very big hammer that's looking for a nail to plagiarize a film by Jeremy Scahill, which you should all see. It's called Dirty Wars. It's excellent. Um, and it's gonna, if it can't find a nail, if it can't find terrorists to kill, it can't find insurgents to prevent from attacking NATO or Afghan convoys, the worry is that the people who control this system are going to continue to look for nails, and continue to look for things to hit. And you're getting into the sort of state of perpetual war, which concerns me. It's not just the satellite network that's complicated. And interestingly, this is all sort of part of um, General Stanley McChrystal's doctrine of changing need, need to know to need to share. Every element in the US government was, uh, intelligence agencies and military was suddenly changed from hoarding its intel to only give to the people who they felt needed it most or, or they were willing to share it with even, to pushing it out there, pushing it out into this global military internet for anybody to draw upon who might need it. Um, I should add that this is one of the reasons why most countries can't have armed drones. It's not just the satellite, military satellite control network. It's also this processing machine that provides the intelligence for them to prosecute the strike. It's also important to grasp this idea of the intelligence machine, this apparatus, because I think it's one of the weak points of drones. Because by and large, they're pretty good at getting a missile from where they launch it to where they want it to go. It's a laser-guided thing. You know, it's fairly sophisticated. Um, but it's only as discriminating as people would want to, people claim it to be. Its accuracy is one thing, it's discrimination, being able to hit the right target and not kill civilians, bystanders, knock down the wrong building. It's only as good as the intelligence that feeds it. If it's so precise, and yet it hits the wrong house, which it, they do, then it's the least discriminating weapon you can imagine. Or at least I think so. I know there are plenty of people who would contend that. Um, I should probably talk about what we do. I'm not aware of the time. How are we doing? How long have I got left? You have 20 minutes. 20 minutes, right. We've got to crack on. Um, the work we do um, is... Uh, so what I've been talking about is basically remote warfare, remote control warfare. The work we do is essentially remote control journalism. Um, we work in North London. Um, but we cover Pakistan, Yemen, and Somalia, and we do this through open sources, through news reports, NGO reports. We uh, 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 send researchers out into the field, do our own field investigations. Other people do field investigations. We collect as much information as possible from the open, open sources using the Internet, using um, Google, using uh, 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 social media, other forms of media. We still also have lunch with sources, which is great. The lunch-based lunch pursuit of truth is what investigative journalism is all about. Um, and we collect all of this information, and we use that to build a database of drone strikes and the people who have been killed in these drone strikes. This is the casualty recording portion of what we do. I mean, we also add the, the journalistic element to it. We get our sources in Pakistan to provide us with secret government documents which bolster our work, but the overriding, overriding quantity of it is from these open sources, which we aggregate together and use to construct data on number of strikes, where the strikes are, when they happened, how many people they killed, how many of those people were civilians. I say it's remote journalism, which it is for me, but it's not for the people that we rely on, who are the people who are actually doing the reporting on the ground, and who are risking their liberty and much more often their life in order to cover these drone strikes, and without them, we couldn't do what we do. And also say that the US is carrying out a remote war, remote control war, um, which is true for the US, but it's not true for the people who are on the receiving end of it. But it's also not true for the broader communities, because it's a displaced form of warfare. 
You've got two belligerents, and one of them's untouchable. The second belligerent is going to strike out at anybody they can. By and large, that's the security apparatus of the state within they live. The Pakistani state police suffer atrocities at the hands of the Taliban. In Yemen, the Al-Qaeda and the Arabian Peninsula forces will frequently say that they've attacked a military installation believing that it's where drones are controlled from. And it's drones, specifically, that they say, this is why we've gone in here. Horrifically, they did that um, late last year in the Ministry of Defense in Sana'a, uh, where they also attacked a hospital. Doctors, nurses, patients were killed. It was um, an atrocity. There's also the issue of informants. I mean, these drones, as I say, can't run without intelligence, and you need human intelligence. And they, whether or not they're spies, I suppose, is immaterial. People in that part of the world who are suspected of being spy spies suffer a horrible fate, mutilation, murder, and then being left in a town square with a dollar bill stuck in their mouth. That's what they do in Pakistan. Yemen and Somalia, they crucify them or stone them to death. Quickly on to the three countries that we cover. As I say, Pakistan, Yemen, and Somalia. Our focus has been on Pakistan predominantly. This is because, as of this month, there have been 401 drone strikes there since 2004, much less in Yemen and Somalia. But they are the three countries outside of Afghanistan where the US is conducting its covert war, where it is carrying out targeted killings with drones and other weapons beyond the boundaries of a UN-sanctioned hot battlefield. Um, get on to Pakistan in a minute, start with Somalia because it's the smallest. There is, I, I, I won't labor the point about Somalia, but there is no civil society really and there hasn't been for a number of years. Journalism there is extraordinarily difficult to do and incredibly dangerous. Our practice of remote journalism, or however you might like to call it, is therefore hampered. Um, it's very difficult for us to get information out of the country and undoubtedly US actions are being underreported. Um, that said, there are two drone strikes in particular, January and February 2012, which stand out from Somalia because they killed two people who were described as former British citizens, which puzzled us for a minute until we found out that the reason why they were former British citizens is because they had had their British citizenship removed. It had been stripped from them. They had um, other nationalities. They were dual nationals. And the Home Secretary, whilst they were out of the country, with a stroke of her executive pen, decided that they... Their presence in the UK and their possession of British citizenship was um, no longer conducive to public good. Um, we started a project off the back of this discovery called the Deprivation of Citizenship Project, and it's been done a lot more, not only to people with, well, people born outside the UK who have become naturalised citizens, but also people who've been born in the UK and happen to hold dual nationality. Um, and uh, the, the, the government at the moment is trying to bring in rules which will mean that they can strip people of their citizenship when they don't hold another nationality, rendering them stateless. I'm not going to go on about this too much, and I would urge you not to ask me questions about it, but to go to our website, because I didn't actually work on that project very much. Excellent though it is, um, it was all down to my former colleague, Alice Ross. Um, but yeah, it's an it's a interesting and live issue. Um, Yemen is a, a complicated country. We know more about it than we do about Somalia, but Yemen, we don't necessarily know who's killing people in Yemen. We don't necessarily know what they're using. So we know that the US is using drones. We know that the US is using conventional aircraft to carry out strikes. And we also know that they've used cruise missiles to carry out strikes. But we also know that the Yemen Air Force is active in the country. We also know that the Saudi Arabian Air Force is active in the country. So when a drone strike happens in a desolate part of Yemen where there's not exactly many people around to witness it happen and it does get reported. How do we know that that person has reported that it's a drone strike, knows it's a drone strike? It could just be missile flying from top of the hill or from any kind of aircraft. Um, it helps that through an investigation we did back in 2012 that we know that the Yemen Air Force is barely functional. They can't carry out precision strikes and they can't even fly at night. So we can start to sort of divine from our understanding and our knowledge of what they're capable of, that if it hit a moving vehicle, they can't have done it. If it happened at night, they can't have done it. And you have to start then interrogating what data we can collect from our open sources and interrogating our sources, our personal sources in Yemen, to try and figure out to what extent we can decide if something's a 
confirmed US drone strike or remains of possible US, US drone strike. Um, like Somalia, there are notable cases that have been prosecuted in Yemen. Um, Anwar al Awlaki, for example, US citizen, born in New Mexico, I think, or Colorado, um, killed in September 2011, um, supposedly in AQAP, an Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, sorry, um, big wig. Um, he was a print preacher. He was certainly a thorn in the side of the US administration. Shortly after he was killed, his son was killed. His son was 16 years old, um, Abdul Rahman. Um, and he was killed whilst he was having a barbecue with his friends. Um, possibly an example of bad intelligence again. I don't know. Um, there's also one other instance which I'll tell you about because it sticks in my mind because it's horrific. It's not a drone strike, it's a cruise missile strike. December 17th, 2009. The shadowy US, shadowy U.S. Special Forces of Command that controls a lot of the operations in Yemen with the CIA. It's called JSOC, Joint Special Operations Command. It orders a U.S. submarine to fire at least one cruise missile at what it thought was an Al-Qaeda encampment in this place called Majala. It wasn't an Al-Qaeda encampment. It was a pretty poor um, Yemeni tribe who had set up camp in that particular area. The cruise missile hit... Um, the cruise missile was loaded with cluster bombs. Each cluster bomb was filled with an incendiary material. When interviewed by Jeremy Scahill, as it happens, after the strike, somebody who was one of the first responders to arrive said that they couldn't differentiate between human remains and animal remains. The carnage was so extensive and horrific. Um, strikes in Yemen have followed an interesting pattern. Basically, back in 2011, if you remember, there was this thing called the Arab Spring. The Yemenis decided that they, were quite, they had quite enough of 30 years of kleptocratic rule by Ali Abdullah Saleh and asked him to go away. He responded by killing unarmed protesters. In order to do that, he drew his Republican Guard out of some of the areas in the south and put them up in the cities to break up the protests. Al-Qaeda took advantage of this and took control of a a sizable chunk of the country and started to govern it. They cleared away rubbish, they set up courts, they fixed the electricity power lines, they did stuff that the central government had just not really bothered to do. Um, it wasn't until the start of 2012 when a US and Saudi-backed new government was in place that the Yemenis finally decided to try and shift this, um, this enclave out of their territory. Um, and the US came in and hit Al-Qaeda very hard. Um, in the space of 2012, at most, we've recorded 140 airstrikes. We've only been able to confirm between 30 and 40 of them, but if you consider the year before, the maximum number of airstrikes that we recorded, US and otherwise, was 40. This was a, this was a step up. I mentioned one limitation of drones, the intelligence. There's another. And that's the, the operators in Creech or Waddington in Lincolnshire, which is where some of the British drones are operated from. The, the view that they get of targets on the ground is like looking through a drinking straw. It's quite a good image, but it's very limited. April this year, a truck full of alleged Al-Qaeda members was targeted by a drone. Because of this drinking straw perspective, I surmise, didn't see the car full of um, day laborers and civilians coming the other way. The truck was taken out, unfortunately, so was the, um, so were the civilians. At least three people were killed, as many as eight people were killed in that vehicle. About um, five to ten were killed in the supposedly Al-Qaeda video. I mean, a mistake, an accident, but when people say that drones are infallible or drones are the most discriminating weapon system you'll ever come across, take it with a pinch of salt. There are limits to it, and there are limits to all of these systems, and they are not... I keep on saying, a panacea. So, how long do I have? Ten minutes. Ten minutes, cool. So we can get on to Pakistan, which is, you know, the one that I know most about, and it's the one that we've worked on the most. Um, and it's the one that we've spun a new project out of called Naming the Dead, which I've been working on quite a lot recently and had an interesting experience with on Reddit not too long ago, <laughs> um, as, a, as a consequence of. But Pakistan. Pakistan, June 2004, June 17th, 2004, I think it was the first drone strike in Pakistan. All drone strikes in Pakistan have been done by the CIA. 
elsewhere, it's US military and CIA, or just US military, but in Pakistan, just the CIA. And the reason is, we understand the reason is quite interesting, and it's to do with concepts of sovereignty. So all of the drone strikes in Pakistan have been hitting in an area called the Federally Administered Tribal Areas, the FATA. This is a Pashtun area that's divided from the Pashtun areas of Afghanistan by the Durand Line, a bit of um, Anglo-Imperial cartography. Um, and it's governed by a set of rules that were basically put in place by the Brits back at the end of the 19th, uh, start of the 20th century. Yeah, I mean, the, the, it's divided into different tribal agencies, so North Waziristan Agency, Khyber Agency. Those are governed by um, tribal agents. And they have extraordinary power. They have the right, they have the right to, if they say to a village, do this, and they refuse, they can tell the next door village to destroy that village. They have the right to collective punishment. Surrender us this criminal who is um, living amongst you. If you refuse, we'll tear your house down and everybody else's house down. And they have no recourse. It's not exactly a democratic system. The courts of Pakistan don't apply in the FATA. The reason why the US is using drones, the reason why the US is using CIA drones is because FATA is already a shady um, uh, 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 area of sovereignty. It's not necessarily Pakistan. It is Pakistan, but it's not entirely. And they're using the CIA because it's a totally secret organization. Like in its very foundation, it is legally obliged to be secret. And they're using drones because there isn't a pilot on board. You combine all of these things and you can fudge it and say, it's not as much of an invasion of our sovereignty as if they sent a tank over the border or a helicopter over the border. And you remember the fuss that was kicked up when they sent a helicopter from Afghanistan, or several helicopters in, from Afghanistan to Abbottabad to kill bin Laden. Into the settled areas of Pakistan, soldiers on the ground, it was an affront to Pakistan sovereignty. June 2004 is also interesting because there are plenty of terrorists in Pakistan who are well, at the time, certainly, who presumably were plotting to blow up New York, uh, uh, US cities and who were crossing over into Afghanistan to kill US soldiers and NATO soldiers. But there are also, and there still are, plenty of people who sort of avoid that. They sort of eschew that, that, that kind of work. And they focus more on trying to bring down the Pakistani state and institute a government not that dissimilar from what was in Kabul until 2001, Pakistan Taliban. The guy who was targeted on June 2004, this guy called Nek Mohammed, was a moderately senior character in the Pakistan Taliban, not much of a threat to the US. I mean, he was harboring some of the people who had fled Afghanistan when the Americans moved in. He was looking after them and sheltering them. But he wasn't, you know, he wasn't the next um, uh, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. What he was, though, was an embarrassment to the Pakistan government. He had humiliated the Pakistan military and forced them into a very embarrassing ceasefire with him when they failed completely to oust him from his fortress-like house in, um, in Waziristan. So it's our understanding now, through some reporting by the New York Times and by the McClatchy News Agency and from some leaked documents, that the CIA got together with the ISI, formed an agreement and said, listen, guys, we'll rub out your enemies. We'll go after the Pakistan Taliban if you allow us to fly our drones over your territory and take out al-Qaeda. Pakistan government, or an element of it called the ISI, which is this omnipotent um, spy agency uh, in Pakistan, um, agreed. And so, Nek Mohammed, and so Nek Mohammed was killed. And there have been other instances as well of Pakistan Taliban fighters who have been killed, um, uh, who are not necessarily people who face, who, who, who pose even much of a threat to the US or even to US soldiers in Afghanistan. Um, because that is essentially what's happening in Pakistan at the moment is that it, or has been happening in Pakistan at the moment, is that it's a counterinsurgency operation as much as a counterterrorism operation. We're told by the US government that they're going after Al Qaeda and associated forces. Just after 9 11, they made a law called the Authorization for the Use of Military Force. We didn't even mention Al Qaeda because they had no idea who had carried out the 9 11 attacks, but whoever it was, they were going to kill them. That's the basis for the drone strikes. Going after Al Qaeda, going after Al Qaeda's allies like the Haqqani Network and the Afghan Taliban, but there are organizations and individuals who don't necessarily fit into that rubric. And the reason is because they are not 
associated with al-Qaeda that closely. They are living in Pakistan and fighting it in Afghanistan. And the US has decided to spill over from Afghanistan to kill people in Pakistan as a way of helping, or they were when they were there. They've obviously withdrawn at the moment, but in the, in the past, in the recent past, they were um, trying to get people on the other side of the border as well as on the Afghan side of the border. Um, work out how much I can fit into my last few minutes. Um, <laughs> thank you very much. Um, just some more examples of drone strikes um, that demonstrate, as far as I'm concerned, A, how the US has developed its drone war over the last 10 years, um, and also the limitations of drones. So the first one um, uh, is an example of a signature strike. A signature strike is where you target people not on their identity, but on their pattern of life, their behavior. You don't know their name, but you know that they're up to no good, and you watch them for a prolonged period of time and decide, yeah, 10 guys with Kalashnikovs in the back of a pickup truck driving towards Afghanistan. I reckon they're probably going to mm -hmm. go and fight our soldiers in Afghanistan. So sort of that's the principle of it. Unfortunately, on, on March 17th, 2011, in a place called Datakhel, they got it really, really wrong. Um, about 40, 45, 50 people were gathered together for a jirga, a council meeting, to resolve a dispute over a local uh, mine, local chromite mine. Um, this gathering was probably attended by a small, a small handful of Taliban representatives, but it was a tribal meeting to, 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 to try and um, uh, resolve this dispute. It was the, the local brigadier, the local army commander, was aware of it. Yet despite <coughs> this, the CIA, uh, killed, well, our, our estimates begin at about 25 and go up to about 41. Um, I think it's closer to the 40 end than the 25 end, but the nature of our methodology means that we've got that quite substantial range. Um, the US insisted after the strike that they were definitely not civilians, man. They were up to no good. They were Taliban. But let slip that they knew that they were Taliban because of the way that they were behaving, not because of who they were. Two other strikes which are interesting. One was on October, in October 2006. The US thought they got Ayman al-Zawahiri. This is an example of bad intelligence. They thought they got Ayman al-Zawahiri, then second in command of al-Qaeda, now obviously leader of an element of al-Qaeda because it's fractured so much. Um, and they thought they traced him to a madrasa, a religious school. And they flattened it. And they killed 80, 81 people, 79 of them children. Um, Zawahiri was not even near. Uh, but as an example of how they've developed the system, they've developed their understanding of drone technology and how they've developed the way that they prosecute this. November last year, they went after this guy called Sangin Zadran. He's a member of the, was a member of the Haqqani Network, which is a part of the Afghan insurgency. He was also in a madrasa. And there were also about 80 students of the madrasa sleeping there overnight. And they struck um, in, the, in the small hours, about sort of 5 a.m. or something like that. But they didn't flatten the whole building. They just took out the room. And they killed him and the half dozen people he was meeting with. Now, I personally think it's extraordinarily irresponsible to blow, try and blow up even one room in a school. Um, but it demonstrates the way that they've changed their tactics and they've changed their, their behavior to some extent. It doesn't look like I'm going to get a chance to talk too much about naming the dead. But in brief, it, in brief then, it's an extension of our... Um, casualty recording practices. So up until um, two years ago, we were essentially just monitoring the number of people who were killed, recording that as a range, as a casualty estimate. Um, it now stands at just under 2,400 to just over 3,400 killed in Pakistan out of 401 drone strikes. Um, but we were already also picking up names. We were becoming aware of names when in, in the day-to-day -day reporting of drone strikes. And we were sort of collecting them on an ad hoc basis. And we started to sort of feel that actually it's not just enough to, to tally the dead. You need, to, you need to go a bit further. You need to not necessarily memorialize them in a, in a sort of celebrant way, but in, but in order to recognize that these people were people regardless of their affiliation, whether they were the most horrible Taliban commander or they were just a day laborer who got in the wrong car. Recording their name is a very important part of recording the conflict because ultimately they are the ones who are 
good or bad or indifferent, who are the, the, the who have paid the ultimate price for whatever is being done. I mean, there's uh, not many people wearing poppies here today, but we've done casualty recording as a nation in the past. We've memorialized the people who sacrificed their lives for our country. And one of the principles of casualty recording is that you should go a bit further than that and not just focus on your guys, but everyone, everybody who's been the victim of whatever violence that's being prosecuted. If it's drone strikes in Pakistan, the Lord's Resistance Army in um, Central Africa, <coughs> the war in Bosnia and the Balkans. And so that's what we've tried to do. We've got about 700 names at the moment, of about 2,300, 2,400, so we've got a long way to go. Um, we've probably added about 150 names from when we started. We started with about 550, we've got up to 700. Um, and it's very difficult and slow progress. Um, and I'd be happy to discuss with you as to why it's difficult and slow progress. But I feel I should probably stop there and let you all try and digest it a bit. Thank you very much, Jack. Is there anybody in the room who has a first question? and bodies, um, I think, uh, has always been really interesting to me in terms of the use of this technology. How much do you think that the lack of a physical pilot um, in war zones affects the decision to update this technology? Because there seems to be this a weird relationship between the fact that there's, there's likely uh, you know, a political reason for, for wanting to push the fact there's no physical pilot and you can see the, 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 the rationale behind that. Coupled with the fact that the technology, like you say, is limited to the point where not only is there a pilot error to, to uh, contend with, that, that always has been in, um, in mm. military situations, but now also the technological mediation is slower than reflexes are if there's like a two or three second delay, yeah. as you say. So there seems to be this weird clash between the fact that, that that would almost certainly create more civilian casualties or collateral damage, as mm. you might point out as an alternate term of, of, of bad time between, there, so there's these extra, you know, you know potential for, for, for extra civilian death, it seems like, um, clashed against what I, what there seems to be public, you know, uh, popularly pushed about the benefits of unmanned drones being the fact there's not one person in the drone, you know. Yeah, yeah. There seems to be, a, there's the potential for a lot more uh, other innocent people to be killed because of that technology. I mean, the reason why we, I mean, it's interesting, I mean, the, the unmanned versus unmanned and how it affects decision making to prosecute conflict is really interesting and it's not, it, 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 it's complicated, obviously. Um, the reason why we started doing our project before I joined the Bureau, about a year before I joined the Bureau, is because we realized that there was um, this uh, uh, rhetoric from Washington that these things were surgically precise and they were lancing the tumor of Al-Qaeda and all that sort of thing. Scalpel was a common sort of image. Um, and this just wasn't borne out by the um, anecdotal evidence that was coming from Pakistan. Um, and so we started to, decided to start collecting the data. I think the circumstances are such that an unmanned system like drones can operate in Pakistan and were operating there broadly speaking, under a blanket of secrecy. This is, you know, the US government, it leaks like a sieve, so obviously we knew that the drones were, drone strikes were happening, but I don't think people fully understood the full extent of what was being done. And I should say that, you know, 2010 was the peak of drone strikes. So there's 128 drone strikes, uh, at least 80 civilians killed. Um, the year before, there were more civilians killed. But since then, it's, it's sort of fallen away. So far this year, there's been 18, though admittedly nine of those were last month. Um, and last year and this year, we haven't recorded a confirmed civilian casualty. They've killed scores of people, but we haven't got a confirmed <coughs> civilian. 
That's in part to do with our methodology, and it's in part to do with the way that the information is produced for us to develop our data by journalists and field investigations and so forth. And there have been reports of civilian casualties, but we need two reports of one civilian casualty to count it as a confirmed casualty. That's the nature of our methodology. So I think there are a, 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 a massive combination of factors. The unmanned nature of the system and the effect that has on perceived sort of sovereignty and that sort of thing, combined with the uh, 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 situation on the ground where reporting is more or less good, um, can mean that you can do almost what you want, like blowing up a school or something like that. And I think the cold, hard light of um, uh, media coverage, critical media coverage, has meant that the civilian casualties have dropped away. I also think they're being more careful for other reasons, but I do think they're getting some negative press. Quickly, um, compare it with Syria, um, where the US has been carrying out a bunch of airstrikes of late. Uh, within hours of the first strikes, reports of civilian casualties emerged. It's because in Syria, it was an established society, a very rich established society until the civil war started. And that civil society that was there already converted into casualty recording organizations and they started to record casualties and they're now very good at it, much better than us. So they've got a great network of sources on the ground. And so despite the fact that they've used drones as well as conventional aircraft in Syria, we know what they've been doing because of the situation on the ground. So I think it's much more complicated than whether it's manned or unmanned. I think it's a broad number of factors and I hope I answered your question. Cool. Yeah. That wasn't me asking the five-minute time where I was asking the question. Oh, right. um, so there's a really interesting cat and mouse thing that happens between investigative journalists and investigative sort of forensic investigations that happen between that and the government, where the things that you uncover are essentially benefiting the cause itself, but also potentially cleaning what the organisations such as governments or those who particularly do in care these violences that happen to keen their awareness of this and therefore keep it quieter and drive it on the ground. So how do you feel about the tension between um, doing forensic and investigative journalism and things which bring these things into the open which could potentially create tools or um, approaches to governments or whatever state or institutional violence comes from that to, to use those? Is, how do you feel about this continual sort of like piling on of, of does that make any sense at all? So, as you uncover things as journalists, mm. journalists, you provide the fact that you can find these things to governments who then close them down further, or obscure them further, or find ways of obscuring them through whatever means. Mm. I think, um, I mean, ultimately, the job of a journalist is to increase the amount of information that's in the world. I mean, it doesn't matter if you make life uncomfortable for a government. I mean, I, to, to some extent, people will say that the, the the bottom line is, if what you're doing doesn't kill somebody, then it's fine. As soon as you're getting into the threat to life or other people, then you need to be obviously careful. Um, and I think the interesting fact about what's been happening in Pakistan is that President Obama has embraced drones, by the way. In his first year in office, he launched more drone, well, the CIA launched more drone strikes in Pakistan under Obama in 2009 than they had done throughout both terms of George Bush. Is 350 out of 401 drone strikes have come during Obama's administration. Um, because of, he first addressed the concept of drones in publicly in 2012. And since then, he's been building this idea of being more transparent about what the US is doing in its counterterrorism operations. Gradually, he has become more transparent. To the, to, the, to, the, to, to the degree that in 20, uh, uh, 2013 or, or May this year, um, uh, he gave two speeches, one at the National Defense University this, uh, last year and one at West Point this year, at about the same time of year, both addressing drones. In one of them, he finally acknowledged that the US has killed civilians. That was the first public acknowledgement that we've had of that by the um, White House. Um, what I think is interesting about the pressure that's been applied to become more transparent is that it's actually not become much more transparent. They are talking about it, but they're not releasing any information except clawed, yeah. well, except for clawed out of them with FOI. So they're talking about it in different ways, and they've also now established it as part of a sort of like a bureaucratic process. So there was this presidential policy paper, secret presidential policy paper, which he signed, which he essentially codified the US use of drones for targeted killing around the world as a 
as a policy, a secret policy, but it has now become sort of, he says, that the use of drones in these instances is now, is now controlled by this very stringent set of rules and regulations which we can't know about. Um, and it's legal because of um, legal findings from the Department of Justice that we can't know about. So it's, it's talking about it, but it's not necessarily being transparent. So actually, we're not really locked in an arms race because we haven't, we haven't really forced anything out of them at all. We can reveal what we can reveal, and we, I think, have got a pretty good understanding of what's happening. It is flawed, and they are casualty estimates, and we don't fully know. Um, but I think we've got a good idea, and yet we still come up against secrecy. I would add, actually, that the American government is amazingly transparent, and if the UK was doing this, then we would have no idea. But that's a whole different story. Westminster is just bewildering, and it's um, lack of transparency. Does that answer you? Yeah. That was, that was um, hi, yeah, I've got just a couple of technical questions referring to what you talked about. The first was because we bought five of our ten drones as emergency measures, they can't fly into the UK. I'm just wondering why. Mm -hmm. And also you said about how more than 90 countries have drones, but only five or six have weaponised drones. And, is, and was that because of the huge body of intelligence that's required to weapon. Is there someone regulating this, I guess, is the question. Who, you know, I, I, I'm realising that's an ironic question, but why aren't those drones allowed to fly in the UK, and why can't they just have badly informed weaponised drones in the other countries? The, well, they can, um, uh, ultimately. The, the British, so basically we've got loads, of, loads and loads of different drones, and we've got 10 armed drones, or the Reaper drones, which are made by the US and we bought from a US company. Um, we had five of them for a while, um, and we bought five more, uh, but for various reasons. The US took priority in the production line, and then I think France took priority in the production line. So it took ages for that second five, that second squadron of five to come online, which it did like this year, months before we pulled out of Afghanistan. Both um, squadrons, all 10 of them, can't fly in the UK because they were an emergency purchase made by the MOD for the war in Afghanistan. So they haven't being clear, certified safe to fly as a system within UK, UK airspace. They, are, they were bought on the hoof and they are not, um, they haven't been extensively tested by the Military Aviation Authority or the Civil Aviation Authority to ensure that they can operate safely within British airspace. And I think there will be such a fuss kicked up by, or a stink kicked up by um, uh, 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 activists and, and, and people in the UK who are concerned about drones um, but I don't think they would try to do that. I think they'd probably just be content to not use, not fly them in the UK. They can store them here in their boxes, which are called coffins, phrasing. Um, uh, but they can't fly them here. Um, uh, in terms of, yes, it is, the, it is the sophisticated nature of the way in which they're controlled that means that other, other countries can't really develop armed drones. Russia, China, the UK, the US, other European allies like France, have secure military satellite networks with which you can use to control and command these things. Um, although NATO allies like the UK for a long time, and we still do, would probably, and France I imagine, and Germany, would base their uh, operators in the US and use the US infrastructure to control their particular drone. So it's, you know, they're all going through the same satellite network, but you're just controlling that aircraft, not that aircraft. That's to have the really sophisticated weaponized drones that we have and the US has um, and China has. Um, however, Hezbollah has experimented with strapping bombs to the bottom of little remote control quadcopter drones that you can buy off Amazon for 100 quid. Um, Iran has experimented with attaching rockets to its drones. Um, Iran hasn't bothered to use missiles. Iran has got a really sophisticated unmanned industry um, but they only create them to fit their need. They don't try and go sort of way out there um, and make these extraordinarily sophisticated things. They just make something that fits their, their purpose. But yeah, there's nothing to stop people from making flying bombs or strapping missiles to the bottom of remote control aircraft. Just they may not be very effective. Yeah, um, thank you very much for your talk and the amazing work that you do with the Bureau. Um, I have a question because some of the things that you described, especially the cases where you mentioned the, um, you know, you described the, the certain cases that you study, um, you know, they sound like murder. Um, so, so the, uh, my question is, you know, like, 
Um, one um, issue that I think is, you know, sort of prominent with drones is the kind of legal construction through which they are operated, and also um, um, like the, the re which uh, creates a kind of legal um, gray area and which allows them to be, to be used. Um, not wanting to go into that specifically, but I'm curious if the uh, if the um, um, research that you have been doing with the Bureau has been used at all in any legal cases that have been filed against uh, countries or governments that are um, operating these kind of, um, doing these kind of operations. If you're aware of that, who's doing that? Um, um, there's, uh, so there's, there was a big um, report by uh, a UN special rapporteur called Ben Emerson into the use of armed drones and the, the law around his, uh, I can't, his human rights special raps, human rights investigator for the UN Human Rights Council. I can't remember what his specific title is, but it's to do with armed violence. He's a British QC. Um, he used our data in his investigation into, he used our, our work in his investigation into the legality or otherwise of drone strikes. Um, he came up with the conclusion that it was, it's, it's, it's hard to tell, it's a grey area, which is not necessarily very helpful, but um, he's fairly sort of high, high, high powered international lawyer who came up with that concept. Um, Lee Day and Reprieve, um, Lee Day is a law firm in North, in North London. Reprieve is a really interesting organization who do amazing work on sort of civil liberties and rights, um, where they'll take on you know, Guantanamo cases. Uh, they exposed the um, torture network of um, black CIA black sites, and they work on drones as well, and they're worth checking out if you have <coughs> a chance. Just had a pretty revelatory case at the international, at the international, the information, you were nodding. What's the acronym again, IPT? I know, it's the one about um, spying on lawyers, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. So they just... Like ignoring legal professional privilege or anything else. Yeah. They just sued, yeah, they just sued the government and discovered that MI5 has been spying on lawyers' communications with people for years. So they, they used our data to try and sue the British government because it was their understanding, it is our understanding, that the British government shares information with the USA, which is they use then to carry out their drone strikes. Um, Lee Day and Reprieve um, brought a case based on uh, the testimony, the experiences of this guy. Um, who was a relative of one of the people who was killed in that March 17 drone strike I mentioned, the, the jerk at the council meeting. Um, and they tried to compel a court to launch a judicial inquiry, a judicial review into the British sharing of intelligence with the US. Surprisingly, the um, British court declined permission. But it was, it was an interesting example. There are other instances as well. Um, but they, they tackle quite specific areas of either international law or, or, or domestic law as a way of trying to get various governments to be more transparent. Uh, quick question um, after that. Um, how complicit are we ourselves, and uh, what's the role of the city and Wall Street and the, you know, the drone industrial complex? And when I say we ourselves, there's this Argus drone that um, has a 1.8 gigapixel camera, allegedly, that uses Nokia cameras, oh, $200,000 worth of Nokia 808 cameras. Oh and kind of form a big swarm, and they can kind of see, uh, they do facial recognition from six, six, kilometer, six kilometers high, mm -hmm. like 20,000 feet, mm -hmm. and um, that's just us feeding that system. That's just me buying an iPhone, mm -hmm. which improves the quality of, of the camera, which feeds back into the, the mass surveillance system um, mm -hmm. of the drone. So kind of us as consumers, but also the kind of financial side or the the bigger corporate side of the drones. Can you say, can you say something about that? I could definitely say something about that if you want to. I just think there's a, a recent piece actually weirdly by Jane Brown is not worth it, it's mm -hmm. called AP New mm -hmm. Limits, which is looking at the links between city finance and drones. Mm -hmm. So looking particularly at how city finance has been funding the use and manufacture and um, implementation of drones across governments. Mm -hmm. So if you can get your hands on a copy, it's very useful. I will definitely look out for that because I haven't seen it yet. Um, I, took, I, I know some of this. We're actually um, thinking about working on a project that's going to deal with this more in depth, if we can find out a way to deal with it more in depth, yeah. and trying to, trying, to, trying to figure out a way into this. Um, but, I mean, the people who make the Predators and Reapers um, uh, is, is a private company, so it's not like your, your um, pension is going to be invested in it. But there are <coughs> massive systems involved here. 
um, communications companies like BT is being um, a, a reprieve is kicking up a massive fuss about BT because they laid a cable connecting a US base in the UK with their base in Djibouti, the fiber optic cable through which they would um, supposedly uh, send information that enables them to control and their drones and prosecute drone strikes in Yemen and Somalia. Um, and there are, there are undoubtedly other organizations, Motorola um, uh, is one that springs to mind that I think provides some sort of element of the infrastructure. High frequency killing. High frequency killing. Is that? I, I mean, the, the dedicated network by BT or by any, it's like the Wall Street um, flash bankers mm. who kind of position themselves in the territory so they have the optimal signal mm -hmm. to do the trading, but it's the same with drones then. If you need, you need broadband or you need, you, mm. need to you need the capacity to do this. Yeah, you need a massive information network. Yeah. It's the military internet. It's huge and it's, yeah, it's being laid by BT and Deutsche Telekom and whoever else wants to get their contract. And they want the contract. It's a lucrative contract. Yeah. Um, but it's, in, it's Byzantine. It's incredibly complicated. And it, to your, ask, your question was how much are we involved and responsible and so forth. And it's impossible to say. Um, and it's down to your, you know, your own understanding of how the different corporations that own the organizations that make the components that fit into your smartphone <coughs> are embroiled in this. And I mean, undoubtedly they are, but a bit quantifying it's going to be incredibly difficult. Manufacturing innovations enables this to happen. There's a kind of famous William Gibson quote that's world about every now and again, which is the street finds its own use for things. When you create something and you manufacture something you in, and you create innovation around something, you don't often know what the secondary or, or the third implementations of that particular technology will be. So it could be a case that you are making a part which along the lines could be essentially picked up by military warfare and like innovation team. Mm -hmm. We say, oh, this is a useful part for us or a useful algorithm that could be part of their software mm -hmm. um, that eventually ends up being part of military technology line. If you look at the, the origins of cricket, so the hot spot, because cricket was originally used for jet engines to pinpoint where jet, jet engines would be on a kind of very, very wide range. Mm. They eventually got whittled down to be something used as sports technology. Wow. You have that from the other end as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. So you end up having um, people who create nominal, tiny little technology, <coughs> but end up being reappropriated with the military technologies because that's how innovation works. You yeah. find one thing and it gets changed and changed and changed. And I mean, the, the, one of the main issues with open source at the moment is there's this constant tension between, like, if we create open source software, are we actually ending up making tools for people that we're trying to be against? Mm -hmm. So, this is what the kind of early question I asked you about was like, when you create anything, you are creating scope for good things and bad things that happen with it. But it's how you explore and create narratives around these things, which end up being the important part. We have like investigative bureaus who are saying, yes, we've created this thing, however, this is where it's being used badly because of X thing. But I mean, those technologies don't come from nowhere, they come from university departments or biomedical departments, that kind of thing. It's, it, they don't have military labs that just innovate this stuff all the time. No, absolutely. Isn't it? <laughs> no, I quite agree. I mean, in terms of drawing the line between what's, being, what's going on in Pakistan and what's going on in um, Imperial College or Cranfield University or whatever is quite difficult. But yes, and this is the nature of, I mean, engineering, bluntly, and the armaments manufacturing sector in particular. Um, and it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's startling, really, to, to, to try and draw a, a line from something which would have been so, so innocuous um, and ended up as a small component in something that delivers missiles to a target somewhere. I mean, it works, it comes the other way as well. Um, military tech, as you say, military technology going into a civilian sphere. And interestingly, um, I think there's, there's a thought amongst the drone industry that they may have meet, met peak military demand or maybe meeting peak military demand. And so the, the, the weaponeers and the armaments manufacturers and the defense firms, to use another euphemism, um, uh, are starting to look as to how they can move into the civilian sphere. So there's an organization called Battle Space, and I don't fully understand what they do, but I think it's to do with software and algorithms, um, uh, who are also part of a, uh, a sort of a drone testing range, which is own, overseen by the Federal Aviation Authority um, at a, I think it's Alaska University in North America, but I'm not sure. Um, and it's a university-driven research area for, to find out how you can incorporate civilian, uh, uh, drones into civilian airspace, and how you can incorporate them into air traffic control systems and that sort of thing. 
And this is, you know, this is a firm that's made a lot of money out of government contracts for, for Predator and Reaper and so forth, and it's now looking for a way to diversify the expertise that it's gained. And it may not come out, it may not be a negative, it may be that they are very beneficial, and they can, they're the ones who crack the code that can allow jetliners with pilots and jetliners without pilots to fly in the same airspace, and that could well be beneficial for us all. But it's, um, yeah, it's the intermingling of the sectors. Yeah. There's a kind of communication going on here. Maybe last question before we, um, I don't know if we have a bar, but if we have a bar before we go, well, in the future we'll have a bar. Um, um, the Bureau has become really established and admired by um, at least a lot of uh, uh, all of us around the world. What's next? What, are you expanding? Are you going to going to documentaries as well, or books? Or what can um, we expect from you? It's quite a long way above my pay grade to say anything definitive. <laughs> to, 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 to say anything definitive, but I mean, one of the things that we were set up to do was to do great investigative journalism and to be innovative. Um, and I like to think we've done great investigative journalism, but I think that we could innovate more. I think we could find interesting new ways of appropriating some of the systems that may have been algorithms and, and, and concepts that may have been used, not necessarily by. Um, the military, but by the uh, intelligence agencies, that sort of thing, so the different ways of um, storing and interrogating data. And I'm not going to listen to all of your phone calls. I mean, the, the, a way, different way of approaching the quantity of data that you take on board. I think it's mean, quite good fun to start doing a sort of an open source, um, vast open source database. Um, so innovation is definitely something we need to be doing, and it's going to pr pr probably be online rather than in books or um, in, in, in terms of broadcast film or anything mm. like that. I mean, we tried making films before, and we found it wasn't worth the time that we were putting into it to get the product out of it. Um, so, yeah, creating interesting and innovative um, ways of representing stories online and collaborating with people. So if there's anybody in the audience who wants to collaborate with us and can design us an amazing infographic that will win us an award, next year. Um, please do grab me at the end. Um, but yeah, so I think it's continuing to do one thing, but to try and start to branch and broaden our innovative side uh, as well. Thank you very much, Jack. So